So what I want to do today is to discuss spin-spin coupling in uh, stereochemistry and structure determination. And this is really one of the reasons we've spent so much time talking about coupling patterns, why I've given you an extensive handout uh, and workbook to understand coupling analysis, why we've looked at multiplets uh, the last couple of lectures and tried to understand them and really begin to understand when you could apply first order analysis, even though I've given us the very dire warning that almost everything you learned is not quite true. You know, I've said most of the time you can get away treating things as you would think about coupling analysis and uh, as a sophomore. So one of the points that we learned is that vicinal couplings, three bond couplings, depend a lot on stereochemistry on, on, and conformation. We talked about alkenes, and I said that for a cis alkene, a typical J uh, HH, a typical three bond coupling for the cis alkene is on the order of 10 hertz, we saw 11 hertz in the example we analyzed where I gave us some real data. The typical trans coupling, J3HH3 bond coupling is on the order of 17 hertz. And so it's very easy if you can assign your hydrogens on an alkene to go ahead and analyze stereochemistry in the case of the cyclohexane, which is a nice archetype for conformation, we talked about the coupling between axial and equatorial hydrogens. And if your cyclohexane is locked, in other words, if it's not flipping, let's say I had a substituent on the ring, so that this hydrogen was always axial, and this hydrogen was always axial, and this hydrogen was always equatorial, and this hydrogen was always equatorial, we'd have about 180 degree dihedral angle between the axial hydrogens. So the axial-axial coupling, you've got a good anti-periplanar relationship between the two hydrogens, if you do a Newman projection down the bond, put it another way, the electrons in the hydrogen are basically, well, we'll just keep it at 180 degree dihedral angle. And that gives rise to about eight to 10 Hertz coupling. And these are approximate numbers. You'll certainly see examples with 11 Hertz. Our axial equatorial relationship is 160 degrees. That gives rise to about a two or three hertz coupling. Again, you might see examples with four hertz. And our equatorial equatorial dihedral angle is also about 60 degrees, is 60 degrees in an ideal cyclohexane. And again, you're going to see about two to three hertz as a typical coupling. So, and you have lots more relationships like this. These types of relationships even come up in long range coupling and allylic coupling where the general principle is that anti-periplanar relationships give rise to the biggest couplings. Um, Sin periplanar or 60 degree relationships give rise to some coupling, 90 degree relationships give rise to essentially no coupling or little or no coupling. So with this little bit of knowledge, I'm going to take a look at a very simple reaction here, very simple example, sort of a bread and butter example of where we might want to determine stereochemistry. It's a real reaction that my laboratory did as part of a, a synthesis of a molecule that we were making a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago in the 90s, 
where we took nitrocyclohexene and we reacted it with, allowed it to react with aniline, with aminobenzene, aniline is the common name, and we got an adduct, the nitrogen is nucleophilic, an alpha beta unsaturated nitro compound, a vinyl nitro, nitro compound is electrophilic at the beta position. And so the adduct that forms now has the amino phenyl group at the beta position, and the nitro group attached to the other carbon. And so the question that comes to mind is a very simple stereochemical question, question indeed that we had to answer, and we're going to look at uh, some data from my lab. And that is, did we get the trans adduct or the cis adduct? And although I've drawn a single enantiomer, so you can see an emphasis on the relative stereochemistry, of course, in both cases, you would have the racemic material. And that's fine. The spectrum of the plus enantiomer is going to be identical to the spectrum of the minus enantiomer is going to be identical to the spectrum of the racemic. That's fine. You know, you cannot tell enantiomers apart by NMR without some additional stereochemistry. And there are techniques and we'll talk about those later in the course. But the question is, do we have this or do we have this? So let us take a look. And it's good to start with a hypothesis. And then it's good to have a competing hypothesis. In other words, we need to be able to examine the NMR spectrum and ask, are the data consistent with, say, this molecule, the transdiastereomer? That's part of the answer to the question, but are the data inconsistent with the cis diastereomer? And that's the other part. And this is just critical because once you head down a road, you know, every reaction you run is a hypothesis. You're testing if you mix A and B, do you get C? This is not a given. Even if it's a literature published reaction, it's not a given that they got it right. And you certainly don't want to get it wrong and contribute to junk in the literature, or even worse, start down a road to your dissertation and find at the end of four or five years of hard work that you're publishing that the data of the natural product that you've synthesized don't match the published data and then say, oh crap, what's the matter? And realize that my, my dissertation is not total synthesis of gigantanine, but rather total synthesis of epi, epi gigantanine, much less interesting. All right, so our hypothesis was that we would get the thermodynamically more stable transdiastereomer, and on a cyclohexane ring, substituents, if possible, generally want to be equatorial. Axial gives one three diaxial interactions. So if we have the uh, transdi substituted molecule, our expectation would be it would look something 
like this, where here's our cyclohexane ring and our nitro group would be in an equatorial position. And there would be a hydrogen in the axial position. And our aniline group would be in the equatorial position. And there would be a hydrogen alpha to it in the axial position. And then that these hydrogens would couple to each other. So the question is, do we, what is the coupling constant between the two hydrogens that are next to these, uh, that are next to the substituents? And those hydrogens, we would also expect to couple to the hydrogens that are one over. And so our hypothesis then is that the hydrogen that's alpha to the nitro group, that's next to the nitro group, in addition to having a big axial axial coupling, is going to have another large axial axial coupling, and it's going to have a small axial equatorial coupling. In other words, I would expect for this hydrogen to see two large couplings and one small coupling. And for this hydrogen, the one that's alpha to the amino uh, group, the one that's next to the amino group, I'd expect to see coupling is mutual. So we'd see coupling to the other axial hydrogen, to the axial hydrogen next to the nitro group. And then we'd see another large coupling to the axial hydrogen that's over here and a small coupling to this hydrogen. Now, coupling to amino groups is variable. Sometimes you will see it, sometimes you will not, depending on the rate of exchange. And furthermore, we don't really have a good thought about the conformation about this dihedral angle. So I really don't know exactly what's going to happen. So I'd expect to see one, uh, two, large couplings, maybe one other coupling. Actually, I'll write this in the order that's most logical. We'll say two large couplings, one small coupling, and maybe one other coupling. Now, one of the things that works out from coupling analysis as we go through our coupling tree, and we see this. So here was what we were doing last time when we were talking about a doublet of doublets. And this was our big J. And this was our small J. And, you know, so we get something like this. And one thing that's very handy to keep in mind is in any multiplet, the distance from outer line to outer line is the sum of the J values. So if you have a doublet of doublets, 
you can immediately check if you got your j's right because the sum of all the j's better be this distance. If you have a quartet, the quartet's going to have three couplings. So if you have a quartet with a one to three to three to one ratio, this distance, because you've got three, three J's, this distance is going to be three times your J value. You've got three couplings making up a quartet. If this is, for example, a CH next to a CH3, and that's a nice thing to know. And that means even if your multiplet is a little bit indistinct, you can immediately tell what the sum of the J's is, and that's useful. And you'll see examples in the homework where I've pulled spectra from Aldrich and I've set rulers on them and I've asked questions about stereochemistry and maybe you can analyze your multiplet, maybe you can't, but you can immediately start to think, oh wait, okay, I'm gonna expect two large J values and one small J value. That distance is gonna be like, you know, 10 plus 10 plus three, if I see that. So keep that in the back of your mind. But this particular example is pretty clear and we're going to be able to pull out all the J's so we don't have to, we don't even have to guess. So let's take a look at the actual spectra that we got and I'll pull up, pull up the spectra. Any questions at this point before I, before I share the screen, before I share my spectra? All right, let me go ahead. I will share my screen. All right, can everyone see the spectrum on your handout? Yes. Great. So this is an example of doing exactly what I've talked about in my little uh, email to people where I had gone ahead, measured the height of each of these integrals in, I forget, it was probably centimeters at the time, wrote the height since the integrals were slanting, slanting downward. And since you know, the baseline wasn't perfectly adjust, adjusted, I simply, to offset any variation, I measured that distance and was able to pretty much finagle, okay, 4.2 centimeters or thereabouts is one, one hydrogen. And then to be able to finagle uh, that I had two hydrogens over here and one hydrogen over here and two hydrogens over here and pretty much finagle. Oh yeah, that looks like a phenyl group with ortho, an ortho doublet, a meta triplet and a para triplet. Here's our phenyl group. Over here we are in this midfield region Two of these peaks are going to correspond to the hydrogens that are next to the nitro group. And the hydrogen that's next to the amino group. And what's that third peak that we see in this middle region? Who has an idea on that? Could it be the NH? Ah, yeah, it's the NH. So even though we didn't quite know what to expect on it, even though we didn't quite know if it would appear, ooh, some reason my, ah, okay. Even though we didn't quite know what to, what to expect, hold on, my stylus isn't quite working here, shoot. That's not good. 
Give me, give me one moment because I'm going to be needing this. It looks like it may have died from want of juice. So let me, I'm gonna plug this in for a second. That's gonna kill, kill the hookup here. So what I was starting to say was even though I didn't quite know where that NH would appear, we can infer what it is. It looks like it's a doublet. And so as a doublet, that means it's J coupling. So hopefully my stylus has come back to life. If not, I will, hold on one sec. Ah, okay, good. Stylus is back to life. Let me share my screen. One more attempt here. Ah, okay. So, as I was saying, even though I wasn't quite sure where it would show up, it looks like it's over here. And it looks like, looks like it is this peak here. Now what I've done to make it a little easier is I've made expansions of those peaks. Oh yeah, and here's, here's the rest of the cyclohexane ring. And one, one handy thing to keep in mind is, although we're not gonna analyze these patterns here, in general, if you uh, take a look at, at Silverstein, in general, the equatorial protons are generally a little more downfield by a few tenths of a ppm. So these are probably all of our H equatorials and our axials are probably here. Generally, generally equatorial is a little more downfield and Silverstein makes an argument about a sig sigma ring current. All right, so back to our multiplets. So I've given us peak printouts here and we're gonna work with those. How would we describe this first multiplet here? What would we describe our coupling pattern as for the one at about 4.4 parts per million? Doublet of doublet of doublets? You could describe it as a doublet of doublet of doublets. Now, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but if we look at the pattern, I see at least here, line, 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 line. And they're in about a one to two to one ratio. So how do we describe this pattern? Double up triplet. triplet doublet. And what? So I hear triplet and I hear doublet. So triplet of doublets. Triplet of doublets. Triplet of doublets. Yep, the big coupling determines the first name of the pattern. The small coupling determines the last name of the pattern. If you have middle couplings, they determine the middle names of the pattern. You can think of this as a trio of doublets. 
And so we have two large coupling constants. And if you're, if you're not comfortable calling it a triplet of doublets, you could call it an apparent triplet of doublets. That's fine too, either way. If you say, well, I see a little bit of distortion over here. We're gonna come back to that little bit of distortion in a moment. And you're gonna, we're gonna talk some more about it. Now, this second pattern, what do we call this pattern? What do we call the one at about 3.9 ppm? Doublet of quartets. A doublet of quartets. Who agrees? I would flip it. Who thinks and flip it, you mean? My quartet of doublets. Quartet of doublets. By show of hands, who thinks it's quartet of doublets? And indeed, the first name is the big coupling. So we could call it a QD or a parent QD, depending on what you felt. But again, you notice a couple of things. You notice the equal spacings. You notice roughly the one to three to three to one um, ratio of the little doublets. And finally, this last one here is a doublet obviously the NH group, because we said the NH group might or might not couple. <clears throat> so which is which? Which is the proton that's alpha to the nitro group and which is the proton that's alpha to the amino group? Um, I think that the one alpha to the amino group is the middle one at around 3.9 ppm. Why do you think that's correct? Why do you think that? Um, cause it's a quartet of doublets. So it's likely that it's coupling to, um, three, uh, protons and then there's maybe coupled to the, uh, amino group. Exactly. So it's coupled to three of the ring hydrogens and the amino group. So there's four couplings total, and we see three couplings making the quartet and one more coupling making the doublet. Whereas in the case of the proton that's alpha to the nitro group, its resonance appears as a triplet of doublets because there's only three couplings to those three ring protons. All right, so at this point, we're ready to analyze our multiplets and extract the coupling constants. I've gone and I've got a peak printout. And what's very useful by having the intensities here on this peak printout and the values in Hertz is I can check myself. So I see shorter, shorter, taller, taller, shorter, shorter for that peak that's centered around 4.3-ish 4. Uh, 4 ppm, 4.4-ish ppm. And so I can go ahead and analyze that peak. And I'm gonna draw some lines here to help me keep myself on track. And then I see eight lines, short, short, tall, 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 short, short for the quartet of doublets. And finally, I see two lines, two lines for the doublet. And the distances between the short lines give rise to the small coupling constant. And so this distance, 1325, this was done on a 300 megahertz spectrometer. So 1325 Hertz and change minus 1321, 60, 361 
is 4.065. The distance between the next pair of lines making the next doublet is 4.036. And the third pair is 4.162. And so I can average those values and say to the nearest tenth, it's 4.1 hertz for our small j. And then I can do lines. So this is lines 1 minus 2, 3 minus 4, 5 minus 6. I can do lines 1 minus 3, 2 minus 4, 3 minus 5, 4 minus 6. You can work that, work that out. And those values are 10.282, 10.253. And here you can see the, the product that we don't really have exactly the same couplings. It's not so much that these are the two coupling constants that make it uh, as we were debating whether it's really a triplet of doublets or an apparent or a DDD, it's that we just can't resolve. So here on this particular one, it's 11.154. And this last line four minus six is 11.280. If I average those, I get 10.7. And so that's the average for, so this is a triplet of doublets, 10.7, 4.1 Hertz. And I can take its position and it's 4.38 is the center position here, right over here, 4.38. I would report this as TD, or if I wanted, I could say apparent TD J equals 10.7 comma 4.1 Hertz. And I had already analyzed the integral. It's one hydrogen. And so that's our analysis of that coupling pattern. Now I have to say, I very much like using Excel and I'm gonna show you how I do that so either by directly copying and pasting or uh, going, into, going into Excel and simply typing the numbers, I can go ahead and calculate much more easily. So here's my Excel spreadsheet. Make it a little bigger. Can you see okay? It's big enough? Yes. Great. All right, so what I can do is just transcribe in my numbers. It works well if you say it out loud. 1187.921, I'm using my number keypad, 1183.630, 1177.774. And I will also just go in and take my line list and use the copy paste function to enter it directly from text into Excel 11.952.908. And it behooves you to check that you've entered your numbers correctly as a scientist handling data. It's really, really, really important to make sure you handle your data accurately. So do that step to check. So for this quartet of doublets, lines one minus two, is the small j lines. Three minus four is the small j, five minus six and seven minus eight. And I will take the average. Oh, 
And what I like about Excel is I can then just again, cut and paste. So lines one minus three, two minus four, three minus five, four minus six, five minus seven, six minus eight. I can copy and paste. Here are my average values. I can get the position and I can do the same thing for the, the doublet. I got that it was 9.5 Hertz. So let me bounce back to my, to my blackboard at this point. And I'm gonna write, write the product of my coupling analysis here. So what we observe here for this proton alpha to the nitro group is it's a triplet of doublets or parent triplet of doublets. I think I called it because everything didn't quite match up as well as I would expect. J equals 10.7, 4.1 Hertz. This proton here is a QD quartet of doublets J equals, I'm going to write it down below, J equals uh, 10.3, 4.2 hertz. And finally, our NH appeared as a doublet, J equals Nine point five hertz. So we look at this and very cool. It's consistent with the diastereomer where we expected. It's consistent with the trans diastereomer, and that's good. We'll come to the cis diastereomer in a second. I want to take questions at this point and I want to show you something. What questions do you have at this point? Um, I have a question. How do you know which peaks to mine at which? Do you have a tip? Ah, how do you know which to minus? So in a triplet of doublets, we, you can think of it, obviously it's not chronological. All the splitting happens at once and it's not even as I hinted at, it's not even as simple as this sees this proton up and this one down, but we can think of it as chronological. We can think of it as sequential. The hydrogen is split by the three big couplings and then it's split into one to two to one pattern. And then it's further split by the two small coupling, by the small couplings. And this is our, so this is our TD splitting tree, and this is our big J. And this is our small J. Ditto here and ditto here. And we give rise to our pattern of line, line, bigger line, bigger line, about twice as big and line, line, and if I call those lines one, two, three, four, five, six, we can easily see that the small j equals one minus two, three minus four, five minus six, and we can see that we've just shifted over by half of the small j for one minus three, in other words, one minus a uh, half of, we've shifted over by half the small j. So in other words, the big J is one minus three. And similarly, the big J is two minus four, three minus five and four minus six. So this distance, this distance, this distance and this distance are all the big J. 
And you can work that out for any of them. So I told you that one thing that's useful to keep in mind is the outer lines are the sum of the J values. In other words, line one to line six is two times the big J plus one time the small J, because we've got two big J's. Uh, another thing that's useful to keep in mind is that for any multiplet, lines one minus two, the first two lines are always going to be, or the last two lines, the distance between them is always going to be the smallest j. And that's gonna get you far up to anything like triplet of doublets, quartet of doublets, quart doublet of quartets, doublet of triplets, all that's easy. Doublet of doublets of doublets, that's easy too. The only one that gets a little hard by this analysis is doublet of doublet of doublet of doublets, four unequal splittings. Your smallest distance is still gonna be, your smallest J is still gonna be the distance between lines one and two. Uh, your next J is gonna be one and three. Determining the next couple of J's is a little tricky. I take you through it on your handout. And the checksum that's always involved is the distance between the outer lines is always the sum of all the J's. You know, like two times the big J plus one time the small J. So once you work through this a little bit, and particularly when you practice with the splitting trees on my handout, you're going to get better at, at these types of analyses. Other sorts of questions. Um, is there W coupling in this example? Ah, brilliant question. Is there W coupling? Not, not that we observe in this example. But in at least one of the homeworks, you will indeed, on a dissymmetrically substituted cyclohexane, where you have two equatorial hydrogens, and I don't recall, I think you have a substituent here, X, I forget the the details of what you have. You may have a substituent here, why, but you do indeed in one of the homework examples, either this week or next, have a hidden W in your molecule. So yes, in a locked cyclohexane, you can indeed sometimes see W coupling. We don't have any Ws in our downfield protons, um, but, and you're not gonna be able to pick it up here, but you do have a W from this hydrogen to that hydrogen. So, so you're not going to pick it up, but there can be W coupling. Other questions? All right, I wanna show you one thing that's very, very cool. And then I wanna wrap up because I said we needed to look at the other diastereomer and make sure that the data aren't consistent with that. So I wanna wrap up and show you something very cool on this spectrum. And I left the sample in an NMR tube overnight. And a day later, I saw something very interesting. The peak that had been a doublet is now a broad singlet. The peak that had been a quartet of doublets is now a triplet of doublets or an apparent triplet of doublets. And that's interesting because that means that our NH is no longer coupling. James, are you supposed to share your screen with us? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Ah. All right, so this is what we saw in the day after. 
The NH was now a broad singlet. It wasn't coupling. The CH that had been a quartet of doublets is now a triplet of doublets or a parent triplet of doublets. We've lost a coupling there. And what's happened is with time, CDCL3 can photooxidize to generate catalytic amounts. So I'll say with H nu, light in the room, and O2, you can get catalytic amounts of DCL, minuscule amounts. And that catalyzes the exchange of that NH group with water in the molecule. So now we're getting more rapid exchange. And as a result, it's no longer J coupling. We've lost our J coupling. And I usually dry my chloroform by passing it through alumina, flame dried alumina that I've dried in a test tube or a crucible over a hot flame to drive out the water that sucks up any water, any acid. Your sample's still not completely anhydrous, but it gets rid of catalytic acid. Then I use that, that CDCL3 to make my sample. I don't pass my sample through the aluminum, the alumina. The other thing that's cool is we were teetering on the edge of coupling here. And although you can't see it very well, you'll notice that now we don't have, all the lines are almost the same height. Now I see eight lines for the other peak. And it is now really breaking down into a DDDD. -D -D -D. We saw a hint that those two big couplings weren't quite the same, but we couldn't quite tease out the other coupling constant. My resolution was just a hair sharper here. My shimming was just a hair sharper. And so that peak that had been sort of a triplet of doublets or an apparent triplet of doublets had now resolved itself into a DDD. So we were teetering on the edge. All right, I wanna wrap up today's lecture though, by talking about the other diastereomer, the one that we need to still check, is our data inconsistent? Are our data, I suppose, plural for data, are our data inconsistent with the cis diastereomer? So in the cis diastereomer, I could envision two conformers. I could envision a conformer where our nitro group is axial and our amino phenyl group is equatorial. And that's probably the conformer that I'm going, going to see because the amino phenyl group is bigger than the nitro group and generally the bigger substituent wants to be equatorial. So this proton here, the one that's alpha to the amino, actually let's start with the one that's alpha to the nitro group. The one that's alpha to the nitro group is now equatorial. So it's going to look very different. It's going to have three small couplings. So it's going to be a Q or a parent Q or something with three small couplings with J of approximately three hydrogens, uh, three hertz. It's going to look very, very different. And this hydrogen, which is axial, the one that's next to the amino phenyl group, this hydrogen is now only going to have one big coupling to this hydrogen. And assuming we continue to couple to this NH group, which we saw in the original spectrum, we'll have two big couplings. And then we're going to have now two small couplings. So this is going to be a TT or a parent TT, something like a TT, but with two big couplings or and two small couplings 
J is about, I'll say tilde 10, three hertz. And that is not consistent with what we observe. And had it been the other confirmer, had our amino phenyl group been axial and our nitro group been equatorial, Now the hydrogen that's alpha to the nitro group will have one big coupling and two small couplings. So it will be a DT or a parent DT with about 10 Hertz for one big coupling and about three Hertz. So I'll write a little tilde. And the hydrogen that's next to the amino phenyl group, again, assuming the J to the amino phenyl group is big, that's gonna be the only big coupling because all of the other couplings, this hydrogen is equatorial. So all of the other couplings are going to be small. So it's going to be a DQ or a parent DQ and J is going to be about 10 and three hertz. So neither of these scenarios are consistent with what we've observed. James, I have a question. Yeah. On that left structure, uh, the one alpha to the amino group, I thought it would only have one large coupling because it only has one axial on the left one, uh, not, yeah. The left one, ah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, what we saw empirically was ah. that it, it coupled to the NH group. And that was also large. And that was large. Oh, okay, okay, that's why. So when I looked at that spectrum, when I looked at the freshly made solution, the first thing yeah. I saw was that the NH was a big doublet, you know, a doublet mm -hmm. with a big J of about 9.5 yeah. Hertz. Yeah. And so, right, experimentally we saw that this was a doublet J equals 9.5 Hertz in the spectrum. And we know coupling is mutual. So in that freshly made spectrum, I'd expect to see this hydrogen split with at least one large coupling and then a second large coupling. Oh, good, good, that makes sense, thank you. Now let's do one last thing. And I want to do that as an end to today's today's lesson. So let us consider the scenario. You'd have to work through it for all the protons. Let's consider the scenario that you had an equilibrium. In other words, that you had a rapid ring flip and you were somewhere in the middle. And I'm only going to consider this one hydrogen. I'm going to call this HA. I'll call this hydrogen here just for the sake of argument HB. I'll call this one HC over here. And I'll call this one HD. And I want to look at how A is coupling because what we're going to see is an average. And so over here, that hydrogen HA couples to HB, HC, and HD. And so on the left-hand side, JAB is about three hertz. JAC is about three hertz. And JAD is about three hertz. In other words, all the couplings that we're seeing for this hydrogen for HA are small. On the right-hand example, JAB is on the order of 10 Hertz. JAC is on the order of three Hertz. And JAD is on the order of three Hertz. And so if we are somewhere in the middle of an equilibrium, 
where we're not all the way to the right, not all the way to the left, and it's quick, then we would expect to see for HA, it would still appear as something like a doublet of triplets or a parent DT. But now our J would be somewhere in the middle. It wouldn't be three, it wouldn't be 10, it would be somewhere in the middle. So our big J would be somewhere between three to 10. I'll say, for example, EG seven, right in the middle or a little more to the left or a little bit more to the right. But our other two J's, our small J's, would both be about three. In other words, it would be a DT with a J that was smaller than 10, but bigger than three and then two, D, two small groups. So hypothetically, EG, DT, J equals seven hertz, three hertz, if I were spot on in the middle. So any final questions or thoughts? And anyone who needs to run off can, because I know we've run a little bit late here. Not on this, James, but are you going to talk about this ugly splitting in an aromatic ring, or have we already covered aromatic rings? Um, we could talk, we'll get more examples of this at five o'clock today. And basically, I've told you that most of the benzene rings you encounter are not first order systems whether it's a paradise substituted benzene, that's an AA prime XX prime system, or an unsubstituted benzene, that's an AA prime, depending on where it may be, B, B prime C system, or AA prime M, M prime X system. None of those are examples where all the protons that are chemically equivalent are also magnetically equivalent. And so you get deviations. And although you can often exact analyze your, your benzene rings as for pseudo first order systems, you see little hints of breakdown from first order behavior because they're not really first order. And we see this in the two paradise substituted aromatics with the extreme close-ups of the uh, aromatic region. And we even see this a little bit in some of the simple benzenes where you'll have the ortho and meta pro the meta and para protons lumped on top of each other and they're a mess. Although you can kind of pick out that the ortho protons look like doublets or something resembling doublets. Also, being able to spot the big J's is useful. It helps you see the forest from the trees. Like an ortho proton on a benzene is going to look primarily like a doublet, even if there are other splittings involved. So we'll get to see more of this in the discussion section. Thank you, James. You're welcome. See you later. See you later. Have a wonderful day. Bye now. Hey, James, before you end, can I say something really quick? Yeah. They have an exam at 10 a.m. on Friday. Would it be possible to end lecture at 9.50 so they have time to switch the Zoom call over? Sure, and thanks for the reminder on that. Give me, give me a little, give me a reminder, but I will, uh, I will try. So it's Friday is the exam, not? They, they have one in MEC tomorrow and one in uh, Organometallic. Okay, program. so I will write myself a note, but you can give me a reminder at the start of class. Thanks. Will do.